Robert Long looked at Emily's talk and says, we need to bring Emily here. So I'm going to give all the credit for this talk to, to Lori Long. And when, when I watched Emily's talk at the Salk Institute, I says, she's discussing things that's important to us as not only as humans, but as educators and as teachers and as members of the community. And her presentation was uh, delightful, to say the least. Uh, a little of her background, she went to UC Berkeley. Uh, and I think prior to that, I think you wanted to be a dancer. Um, even wanted to be a lawyer at one time. That's a little disappointing to hear that. But uh, uh, in fact, I think there is a lawyer in this group, unless he stepped back out uh, in, in this group. But uh, she eventually went and she started looking at kind of the, what it means to be human. Um, and that interested her. In fact, uh, it, it dominated her life. And now she's at a postdoc at the Salk Institute. And you can see the lab that she's working at. I, I think the ideas that she's going to share with us is something that we can bring into the classroom. And that's why we've asked Emily to be here from the Salk Institute. So with that, Emily, it's all yours. Um, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to try to just limit my actual talking on a presentation for like 30 minutes or less because I think the discussion is a lot more fun. Um, and what I'm going to focus on here is more just kind of what circadian rhythms are. Um, and then I'll focus on some of our work that's on what we call time-restricted eating, and this is really going to be about how the timing of eating affects your health and a little bit of clinical data that we've done. Um, and then as far as things like light and sleep and all that fun stuff, we'll just go through it as a discussion. Um, so please interrupt me, ask questions, whatever you'd like. It's a fun way to talk about science. Um, so Einstein had this famous quote that I've always kind of liked, which is the only reason we have time is so everything doesn't happen at once. And if we think about our bodies, we have a lot of incompatible events that occur. And so when we think about circadian rhythms and the circadian system, a lot of it is really just making sure that the right things are happening in the right place at the right time. So it's really coordinating all these different biological events. So as I said today, we're going to talk about a few different aspects of this. Um, and so when we say circadian rhythm, circadian is just Latin for about a day. So there are many different types of biological rhythms. There's Altradian rhythms, which are shorter than a day. There's uh, tidal rhythms. There's um, you know, there's all kinds of different durations. There's sort of annual rhythms, just about a year. Um, but the ones that we're going to talk about are these these 24-hour rhythms. So on a 24-hour scale, um, they're internal rhythms. So even if you were in a constant environment and you had no cues to know the time of day, you would still have approximately a 24-hour rhythm. There have been studies where humans have been put into caves. Literally, um, <laughs> this was quite a while ago, but it has happened. Um, but we don't live in that world, so we take in cues from the world around us. And the two biggest cues that we have are light and food. And then, you know, also with humans, we have these social interactions and all kinds of other things that can influence us. Um, and these rhythms regulate all kinds of things. So they'll regulate your behavior, your physiology, and even down to the cellular level, and even it, um, it's affecting DNA um, and, and gene transfer. Um, and then every living organism that we know of has these circadian rhythms. So if it is alive, we know that it has a rhythm. In fact, they were first discovered in plants. Um, we've then gone up to mammals, and they have different clocks and different you know, kind of molecular clocks and how they actually work. Um, but you can find rhythms even in singular-celled organisms. It seems to be innate to life. Um, so your body's filled with clocks. So if we're talking about humans, which we're going to talk about for most of today. Um, everything that we do has a rhythm. So if we talk about behavior, things like sleep-wake cycles are the most obvious, but even things like cognition, your mood, um, all of these things are going to oscillate throughout the day. Um, and even your ability to get your deepest sleep is usually, say, around 2 in the morning. Again, this is going to be relative for an individual. Um, your highest alertness is a little bit later in the morning. Um, and then if you look at uh, physiology, so pretty much anything you get tested at a doctor's office has a rhythm. So you could think about uh, body temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, all those things. They all have about a 24-hour rhythm, and you could say, okay, there's things like uh, you have your sharpest rise in blood pressure in the morning. So then actually your highest blood pressure, but it's a sharpest peak. This is actually why when we have daylight savings time and we jump forward, we have an increased rate of heart attacks because you've now missed time and you have this little peak in cortisol, which you normally have to wake you up, that now falls in line with, instead of while you were still kind of slow and getting up in the morning, now it falls in line when you were rushing out the door, and for people that are on the edge, it can tip them over. Um, so you actually have your greatest cardiovascular strength and muscle strength in the afternoon, um, and then 
things like the pancreas and insulin are going to be released at different times of day. Um, and then you can go down to individual cellular level and even the time that certain enzymes are made or hormones are released. And so if we look at an individual cell, almost every single cell in your body, any cell that has DNA, actually has a molecular clock that looks something like this. Um, you should be getting paper out because there's going to be a test at the end. Um, and this is the simple version. Um, <laughs> kidding. It's just kind of cool. So um, I'm sure everyone who's had biology has heard about negative feedback loops, and we think about that with the endocrine system a lot. And biology has this really cool way of kind of regulating itself. And every cell has this clock that's created through this um, called transcriptional translational feedback loop. So it's going to transcribe and translate genes that are called genes and they'll then produce themselves and then come back and stop their own production and this creates a clock and this is again the much simplified version I think I have the slightly more complicated version here which is still a simplification um, but it's cool that you have all these clocks but why would it matter it matters because those clocks then affect almost every other process in your body so we found that almost 85% of all genes in your DNA have a, are rhythmically expressed, meaning they're controlled by this clock. So when they're made, is going to be regulated by this clock system. So it's neat that you have a clock, but it's cooler because it changes when everything happens. It really does coordinate almost everything that's going on in your system. And you have all these clocks throughout your body, millions, billions of clocks throughout your body. And you can imagine if everyone had different watches, they can fall out of sync, and so we have a master clock in our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a fancy sounding name for where it's located. So if this is a, um, a coronal slice, so if you cut your brain this way, that's what you're looking at. And right at the base, in the, really the kind of um, most medial part of the hypothalamus, there's this little bilateral structure that looks kind of like teardrops that sits on the opposite sides of the third ventricle, that is the SCN this really small structure and is a really just kind of fun tangent. It's also one of the only parts of the brain that's ever been transplanted. Not in humans, but in rodents, you can transplant this because it's so little and you can find it so easily. Um, and it's very dense and anyway. So this little piece of brain actually coordinates all the other clocks in your body. And there's been some cool transplant studies actually to prove that this can set the rhythm for everything else. Um, and it, there's all kinds of fun stuff there, but I, I digress. Um, this controls all those other clocks, and it itself has a daily rhythm, which is really cool. I have a little video for you. Um, hope this will play. So even within the SCN, it fluctuates because it's a network of many cells that coordinate and talk to each other. So what you're looking at there is a slice of brain that was tagged with a fluorescent recorder. So you can actually see how each individual cell is like a little dot that's lighting up, and they even have their own flow that goes throughout within the SCN, and that connects to other parts of the brain. It sends neural signals through direct neural connections, and it also sends to your humoral cues throughout the body. And so using the system, it controls many different aspects. As I had said before, we have rhythms throughout our body, so you could look at different organ systems where you see these uh, rhythms and cell cultures, and you can also look at all these different types of kind of physiological outputs, and you can see these really clear rhythms throughout the body. And so when you think about the circadian system, I like to think about it as, okay, so we have an internal circadian system of networks, we'd stay nice and rhythmic, and those internal clocks are going to coordinate all these other things, our behavior, our physiology, and even individual cell function. But we also have to think about our inputs. So, as I said before, the two biggest ones are light and food. Light actually talks directly to the SCN, that clock in our brain. And food is actually going to talk a little bit more directly to all the other peripheral clocks throughout our body. And that's because nutrient availability is going to directly affect how a cell functions. So, changing when you eat gives a timing cue of these nutrients are available now or they're not. And of course, our behavior and our physiology will affect when we get these cues, if you're asleep, you're probably not going to be eating, and hopefully you're not getting a lot of light exposure, vice versa. So we have this very integrated system. So this led to, um, well, this is kind of the background of it, but um, there's this 
thing you may have heard now, or you might have also heard intermittent fasting, um, our lab has studied what we call time-restricted feeding. And the, the point behind this, this all started because of this very basic observation. This all kind of started because there's a model for getting mice fat to then be able to study obese models of whatever you're interested in, diabetes or metabolic disorders. It's called diet-induced obesity. All you do is you give them a high-fat, high-sugar diet, and they get fat. Not surprising. What is interesting is they don't just eat more or higher fatty food, they actually change when they eat. So mice are nocturnal, they're usually awake at night, and they usually sleep during the day, they don't really eat during the day, they just usually eat at night. If you switch them to this high fat food, they actually kind of change that pattern. So they still eat most of their food at night, and now they're also waking up throughout the day and snacking a lot. So the very basic, basic study was, well, what if they couldn't eat during the day? What if they only had access to food at night? And so this is the study that our lab did. We took two groups of mice. You put them both on a high fat diet and you say, okay, one group you only get to eat um, at night and the other group you can eat whenever you want. And they're actually exactly calorie controlled so they are getting the same number of calories. So even the ones that are only eating at night, they're eating the same amount. And when we look over about 12 weeks, this group that could eat whenever they want became fat and the group that only ate at night did not gain weight. Um, this is quite a significant difference. And one of the more exciting things is if we actually look at their liver, um, as expected, the ones that ate whenever they want had this fatty liver disorder, and the ones that ate the same amount of unhealthy food had a very healthy liver. So this was very exciting, right? What if you could eat kind of whatever um, if you just did it at the right time? Now, it's not that simple. Um, but we did find, this is kind of a summary, many studies said, you know, we've replicated this many times, other labs have replicated this, and the basic idea is if you restrict food, you have a higher amplitude of rhythms at many different levels, um, and we've seen this improvement in many different things, so decreased fat, um, better responses to glucose regulation, decreased leptin resistance, which is also associated with obesity, um, healthier livers, lower inflammation, which is linked to you know, inflammation is linked to pretty much every disease, so decreasing inflammation is always helpful. Um, and actually, we also saw improved motor, motor coordination, which was also very exciting. Um, so this is cool, like, okay, what can we do with this? Um, and actually, if you look at many different, many different diseases, uh, when you eat, it's been linked to almost everything. Um, and so we then said, okay, well, what happens to humans? Um, when do humans eat? Is this something we should be thinking about? If people are already eating in short intervals, this doesn't really matter and whatever. And so we had to figure out when people ate. Unfortunately, if you've ever gone to a nutritionist, you probably know they don't usually ask you the time of day that you eat. Um, and the way that they find out what you eat is usually through food, food journals, either 24-hour recalls or maybe a week-long journal. But frequently it's the, you know, the exact amount of what you ate, not when you ate it. And so there really wasn't a good understanding of when people ate. So our lab created a smartphone app called My Circadian Clock. Uh, this wasn't what the original version looked like, but it looks like this now. Um, and the quick question was, okay, when are people eating? So we got 156 people from San Diego area, and we said, please just log everything that you're eating for two weeks. Um, and it automatically, you take a little picture, you give a quick name to it, and it time stamps it. So we're able to you know, see what the time intervals are. If you ask people to take pictures, they will. You get something like this. Um, and then we can put this all together and we can make some cool figures. So we call these fetograms. Um, a fetogram is basically taking each one of those little shots, lining it up across a 24 hour day, and then looking at many days in a row, right? Just because you ate that one day, what does your body actually expect is going to happen? The circadian system is anticipatory. We want to know what normally do. So we can look at things like maybe we want to look at certain time intervals or when are you really eating. We can sum all those days up and we can put them in a circle so it looks more like a 24-hour clock face and that would just be for one participant and we can look at all 156. And you can see people are kind of eating around the clock. You get a little bit of a low point around 3 a.m. And when we looked at it, people actually ate for almost 15 hours a day. More than 50% of people are eating for more than 15 hours a day. Now let's do some math. Okay, there's 24 hours in a day. 
you should be sleeping somewhere between seven to nine hours if you're an adult. If you're eating for 15 hours and sleeping for nine, there's no time where you're not sleeping or eating. You probably don't sleep nine hours every day, say seven. So there's a max of maybe two hours when you were brushing your teeth right before bed and right when you woke up where you weren't consuming something. Um, and we talked to some nutritionists about this and they were like, oh yeah, if your eyes are open, your mouth is open. I'm like, okay, that seems to be true. Um, and so this, is, this was really quite interesting to us. And so that kind of laid the, the groundwork for, yes, maybe this is something we should be addressing because we know the same kind of a behavior in a rodent system leads to lots of different uh, health consequences. There's a different way of looking at it. You can line it up at the local time. These would be 4 a.m. to 4 a.m. from when they start to finish eating. And again, this is over 50% of adults eat for 15 hours or more every day. Some people really do the 18 hour thing. Um, and so the quick uh, test that was done was the same thing we did in mice, what we call time-restricted feeding. Actually, in humans, we now call it time-restricted eating because humans like to say that they eat and not feed. Sometimes we still mix it up. Um, and so we took eight of those participants that had originally logged their food, and we asked them to pick a 10-hour eating window for 16 weeks. And they got to pick what those 10 hours were. So the red bar is when they used what their old eating interval was, at least 14 hours, and the blue bar is the eating interval that they chose. Now, importantly, it has to be the same eating interval, so your body can anticipate it um, and prepare your body for it. And at the end of those 16 weeks, um, our participants lost about 5% of their body weight. We actually followed up with them about a year later without having them log anything, and they were able to keep that off. Now, that's really exciting because if you're familiar with any, anyone who's ever gone on a diet, rebound is a problem. Um, so being able to keep that off is important. Um, and the other key point of that is we didn't ask them to change anything about what they ate or when they worked out or how much they worked out. We only asked them to change the timing of when they ate. We also looked at some other fun in scores, like how energetic they felt in the morning, their overall energy levels, if they were hungry at bedtime, and their sleep satisfaction, and all of those things improved as well, both at the 16-week and one-year point. So the question then was, okay, that was a really cool little pilot study. We think that this might have some traction. How can we use this for something bigger? So um, a pilot study that we are just about to submit um, is looking at how we can use time-restricted eating as a way to help individuals with metabolic syndrome. So if you're not familiar, metabolic syndrome is this kind of combination disorder of basically at risk for diabetes, at risk for cardiovascular events. So you have to have three of five factors, including elevated waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, high triglycerides, uh, low HDL, and I'm forgetting one, oh, high fasting glucose. And so we took about 20 individuals, uh, mixed uh, male and female, um, they're adults, medium age is 58, um, and we looked for all these, um, that they had three of these five factors, and we did this very, Again, straightforward experiment of saying for two weeks we're going to do a baseline to find out when you eat. All of our participants were required to have an eating interval of 14 hours or more. Um, most of our participants, this was not something that was restricted. Um, they naturally did that. Um, and then we put them on a 12-week intervention where we had them uh, just pick a 10-hour eating window that they had to stick to. Um, and then we did some other more fun invasive tests this time. So instead of just looking at weight in a subjective questionnaire, we also got to do, um, we did these more intensive body composition scales. We used continuous glucose monitors, which are these really cool devices that you wear in your arm. It sticks a little filament under the skin, and it's able to measure the interstitial glucose in the interstitial space um, every 15 minutes for 14 days straight. No finger pricking, it's just constantly measuring it. At the end of that, we can get a nice readout. So we're actually able to understand when, um, how your glucose fluctuates. Um, and then we also do traditional blood tests, um, and we use active watches, like this one that I'm wearing here, which is gonna be able to measure activity and um, light as well, and then we can also um, get sleep off of that. So we do this the first two weeks, and we repeat it at the very last two weeks of the study. Um, and so what we had at the beginning, individuals had about 14 and a half hour eating window, and by the end of it, they were able to bring it down to about 10 and a half hours of eating, they decreased their eating window by four hours, which was great, um, and they were pretty adherent to this. Um, and we saw some pretty dramatic changes. So um, some individuals, again, because it's metabolic syndrome, it's a little bit 
tricky because some might uh, vary in what their exact symptoms are. Um, but we saw dramatic changes in blood pressure, um, both increases and decreases in HDL depending on the individual. Uh, same with triglycerides, there was an overall significant decrease there though, and we saw a decrease in fasting glucose as well. Um, and also we saw significant decreases in HbA1c, which is a um, kind of average blood glucose level, uh, significant decreases in LDL, which is known as the bad cholesterol, and we saw a significant weight loss of about 4%. Um, and so on that project, I just have to thank everyone there. Um, but the overall take home from this really is just that we think that time restricted eating actually may be a successful intervention to help with both prevent and treat as a co treatment uh, for a variety of disorders, um, including metabolic syndrome. Um, that study I was just telling you about was a small pilot. We're actually about to start a much larger version. Um, and we're also running this in, in uh, San Diego Fire Department. So we're working with FEMA and DHS to see if time restricted eating can actually help with different types of shift work as well. So that's the little intro that I prepared, but I'd be happy to talk about anything else or take any questions, or if you wanna talk about more about light or sleep. Um, we are actually also working with um, La Jolla High School, and we're working with some of their students, and we've got some launches on them, and we have a whole thing going there too. So anything you'd like to talk about. Um, you talked about like 5% body weight loss. Yeah. Is there any clue on like whether that's fat or water? Yeah, or that's a good question. So we did use the uh, Tanita scales, which they do take a body composition measure. Mm -hmm. um, it's mainly fat. There can be a small amount of lean mass that's also lost. That depends a little bit on how the individual lost weight. We did do a uh, kind of a nutritional analysis as well. If anything, it looks like people either don't change what they eat or they eat slightly more calories while they're losing this weight, which is interesting um, and requires a more in-depth thing. So for this larger version of the study, we're actually doing um, DEXA scans, which if you're familiar, are basically MRIs for body composition, so we'll be able to answer that question a lot better. Yeah. In rodents, we know that it doesn't take away lean mass, and there's other groups that have shown that as well, but it seems to be mainly fat, but you're probably losing a mix of things. That's a great question. I would say anything that isn't water. Um, it does include black coffee, um, which is a debatable issue among different labs. Um, we include coffee for, I think the most straightforward reason is we never tested coffee's effects in rodents. For everything that we test in humans, it's been tested many a time in much more detailed fashion in a rodent first. Um, and to be able to test every single possible thing would take forever in a um, I would say if you were going to have something that wasn't water, a black coffee is going to be less harmful than a bowl of ice cream, <laughs> depending on the time of day and what you're trying to achieve, but you get my point. Um, so usually we say less than five calories, so water with like maybe a lemon, not a big deal. Um, but generally we say just water. So coffees and um, teas we usually do include. There's some debate there, especially on herbal teas. There's some small evidence that could have xenobiotic effects. I don't know if that's true. I don't know exactly how that would affect that. Um, I think if you're not changing the nutrient availability too much, it's, it's more of a caffeine issue than I, that I'm concerned about that could affect um, certain systems that are really long. So in Europe, people tend to eat quite late. I don't know if they're delaying eating in the morning, but they historically have been pretty fit. So yeah, that that's a great question. Um, so Spain usually comes to mind. Um, they eat much later, and actually, if you look at when they actually get sunlight, they're just shifted a bit because they do get sunlight a bit later based on where they are in their time zone. So it seems like it's actually fairly relative, um, which is interesting. Um, we are interested in studying those groups. We do have a collaborator in Switzerland that's running kind of a parallel study that we're trying to get a better understanding how different cultures do it. Um, the app is also available to anyone in the world to use for free. It's just we're going to look at your data for science purposes. Um, and so we are collecting data from around the world. So also trying to translate that so we can get it more populations is interesting. But I think that's a great question. Um, biology is also one of those things where there's no one rule that always works. Kind of like English grammar, it's just, you know, a lot of exceptions. Um, but I think there is this kind of trend here. And there may be you know, kind of qualifiers for different changes. I think men are going to be a little bit different than women. I think 
premenopausal versus postmenopausal women will have different effects and different responses because this is an extremely integrated system and hormone regulation and how all that's working is gonna feed into this. So I think there's a lot of things that have to be taken into consideration that could affect what someone's exact thing should be. Yeah. How do you round up your that's a great question. <laughs> it depends on the study. Emily, could you repeat the questions? Because oh, yeah, she said, how do, we, how do we get participants? Oh. Um, depends on the study dramatically. Uh, so for metabolic syndrome, we're to be teamed up with UCSD ACTRI just down the street from here. Um, so that's their Altman Clinic for Translational Research Institute. So we work with a cardiologist there. And so we actually recruit through the UCSD medical system. Um, it, it depends on the study, though. Like firefighters, we firefighters and we send out flyers and we made a video and all this other fun stuff mm -hmm. um, and have info sessions and recruitment can be tough so it depends but yeah that's how we're doing that yes so hypothetically let's say you work in a k-12 school environment <laughs> what could apply to something like that? Uh -huh. um, if you want to eat something before you start working the latest you're eating at 7 in the morning the 10 hour window is over at 5 p.m. Yep. So it's really obvious why people's windows are 13, 14 hours, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm just curious, I know you've done the one study, you're about to do the bigger one. How much is known so far about the variable of how many times within that span people are eating? Yeah. Of course, how much they eat. Frequency. And yeah, so how much of that has been? Yeah, so out? frequency is a difficult thing to get at. It varies a lot, and people actually kind of interesting. People usually fall into patterns, and that's one of the things we, we want to look to is, is how does the pattern of when you're eating within that window really affect things? Um, and we, we really haven't looked at that yet. The sample size has really been too small. I'm hoping these larger groups will get a better understanding of that. Um, based off of other studies that have just looked at frequency separate from all of this, um, I think a lot of it comes down to, I think most eating pattern style advice all comes down to avoiding binge eating. Um, so the only reason breakfast is the most important of the meal of the day and why it is good and associated with health is because when you don't eat breakfast, you're more likely to binge eat later in the day, you're more likely to make poor food choices. I am unaware of any evidence that says breakfast is good for you for any other reason than avoiding poor choices later. Um, and it does, it kind of sets you up for the day, it stops you from you know getting this, oh, I'm so hungry, I didn't have anything so I can eat anything, and then just grabbing something, and, Usually grabbing something is processed and high calorie and then you're still hungry and you eat more balls. So I see why it does, you know, from a biological point of view, set you up well, but I don't know if that is necessary. Um, the next thing is people have different wants. Some people like are always hungry, so eating a big meal doesn't stop them from also snacking, so that's not a good pattern for them, but other people don't like snacking and they would do much better. So I think there's a high variation of really what's best for someone in that regard. Um, but as far as us looking into that in our participants, we really haven't had a chance yet. Um, the other thing I would say is we do a 10 hour window. Um, in rodent studies, we did everything from 8 to 12 hours. And the only reason we actually stopped at 8 is because if you give them shorter than 8 hours, they can't eat quite as much. And we wanted to control that in the rodents. Um, so I think even if you're doing like an 11 hour or even 12 hour, that's going to be a lot better than like a 15, 16 hour. Um, and what I like to think about it is too is. It's more you're trying to not get food as a confusing cue to your body. So you don't want to give it when it still thinks it's kind of asleep. And by that, I mean you probably still have melatonin in your system. So really early eating can be dangerous. Melatonin actually compromises your ability to properly um, uh, digest glucose. So you can have insulin sensitivity problems if your melatonin is high. So really early morning eating, especially when it's still dark outside, and you haven't gotten a lot of bright light, or you know, the first thing, if you're still kind of hazy, Drinking a lot of calories is not a good idea. Um, so a black coffee would be much better than a coffee with like cream and sugar. Um, and very similarly, if you're eating late at night, the same thing can happen. Or it can tell your body it's time to be awake when you're trying to go to sleep, and then maybe you fall asleep, but the quality of sleep you're not get, it, the quality of sleep you're getting isn't as good. So I think a seven to seven is a lot more reasonable than you know like a five a.m. to a three. Like that might not be as good for somebody. It really kind of depends, and it. I never say there's one time where everyone should start eating because if you wake up at 5 a.m., then your eating window can be very different than someone who wakes up at 8 a.m. Um, so there's no one time. It's all kind of. Building on that, if we go back a few 
slide, yeah. you know the one slide that had your participants' time, body, and I think restriction? And yeah. if you look at their time, right, many of them aren't eating to loose point at, you know, before 7 a.m. Yeah, we have one person who start, used to start around 7. But they have These all, are they've all shifted later in the day. Yeah. But you notice they also usually shift, later. they stop eating so earlier they, as well. Yeah. Is there any, to your point, yes. not necessarily you have to wake up, spring out of bed, eat breakfast, because mm -hmm. it helps curb binge eating, uh -huh. but you want to wake up and eat so that you're setting the tone for the day. Yeah, so again, this is going to depend on your schedule, because if you have a really early shift, or you have to be here very early, or commute, or whatever it is, it, you may not have this luxury, depending. Sure. Um, we usually recommend waiting at least one hour before you have anything. Enough time for your body to kind of wake up, get going. Um, it's not an extreme amount of time that you couldn't handle. I mean, most people, by the time you, you know, you get up, and whatever, prepare yourself for the day. It's not a very long amount of time. So you shouldn't be starving. Um, but some people do decide to push it back a little bit. Um, a lot of people find it's easier to delay the onset of eating than it is to stop eating sooner in the day. And also, the reason why a lot of these are picked for feasibility issues, which I strongly recommend because I don't see this as a diet, I see it as a lifestyle for anyone who's alive, um, healthy or not. Um, and so a lot of this is probably determined by dinner. And when they ate dinner with a significant other, whatever, social event, or when they could get home to eat dinner. So I think a lot of people delay their onset in order to achieve that. Um, and we've worked with, you know, we've run a lot of different sub-studies. People usually pick their onset to be somewhere between 8 and 10 a.m. Um, and in between 6 and 8. I know personally I, I pick it so I know when I can get home and eat dinner with my husband. And that's not going to change. I can change when I eat breakfast. Um, but I also have the luxury of eating breakfast at my desk if I want to. So I have it a little bit more flexible. And, you know, talking to different people, you'll find individuals that are like, oh my gosh, this is the easiest thing. Why can't everyone do it? And you have other people like, I could never eat less than 12 or 13 hours. And it's, it, you listen to their stories as to why, and it makes sense. You know, there's a lot of different challenges that can affect why we eat when we eat. Um, there is one study that we teamed up with a group from Australia, um, and they actually did a small pilot, and they were looking at the timing of the eating window. And they did what they call early time restricted eating or late time restricted eating, where they had individuals eat either early till like, stop eating in the early afternoon or start eating at noon and eat till 8 p.m. And they did an eight hour window. Um, and they found very similar effects on both. They had a couple people that had better results in the early, but there was also a couple that had better results in the afternoon. Um, it was very similar. Um, so there is a group of researchers that are thinking early time restricted eating is better. And I agree, I think really late eating is bad, but mainly because of sleep, so we also, you know, Say, wait at least an hour, and then give yourself at least three hours before you go to sleep to stop eating. Um, and a lot of that is more of a allowing your body to get a proper sleep, because if you're still trying to digest things, um, you're probably not gonna get the proper, to, you know, kind of gut repair over the night, and then it's also an arousal cue to your brain to kind of tell you to be awake. Um, and so we see this a lot in shift workers too, where um, you might be on a very hard schedule. It is very hard to sleep during the day because of your circadian rhythms and how it interacts with your sleep system. And so they'll have like an alcoholic drink or two before they go to bed because it helps them fall asleep, but then the sleep they're getting is really poor. Um, and so giving yourself that buffer um, allows you to get a better sleep. Not that you should eat, you know, two pieces of lettuce and then not eat for 10 hours and then try to sleep. Like that's not gonna go so well. Um, you know, but have a dinner that has some fiber in it, that has some protein in it, and then usually Um, yes, yeah, so it's very interesting. We've never studied kids. Um, one of our collaborators is going down to 12. Um, and they will be doing, I think, an intervention in some. Um, we did get approval to do observations in, in kids, but not to intervene at all, but just to look at when they are eating. Um, I think it's an interesting question. I think we'll probably have more of a, a wider window, maybe a 12-hour eating window or something like that, where it's really not very egregious if you say you should sleep, you know, for about nine hours, and then it's really just two hours before you go to bed and one hour after you wake up or something like that, which is pretty reasonable. I think a similar question arises for um, women that are pregnant. 
um, and potentially how it could affect gestational diabetes and those types of things. And honestly, those are vulnerable populations that we generally try to stay away from. <laughs> um, but they also do need to be studied. So I think it's something that will come out once more uh, larger scales have been done and you know, kind of adults that aren't considered as vulnerable, and it'll kind of trickle down. But I think there will be guidelines. I'm guessing at 11 to 12 hour. If we're going to to become habit forming, like if on YouTube you breakfast at 6.30 mm -hmm. and now when it delays till 11 or whatever, did you, did you look at that? Yeah, so looking at hunger levels is one of those things we've been kind of figuring out. Um, so if you change, you, you adapt to it quite easily. Um, your hunger levels do change. Again, it's an anticipatory system. So um, I also, you know, in the studies, we do have to have this kind of hard cut. Okay, now you're on a 10 hour eating window. Um, I know personally when I did it, I found out what my eating interval was, and then I went down and was like, okay, I'm gonna go for 12 for a few weeks, and now I feel comfortable there. I'm gonna go to 11. And I think pacing yourself down is a lot more successful way to get there. Um, so I would just kind of delay it back a little bit each day until you get to where you want to go. Um, and then once you're there, after about three or four weeks, you'll notice you don't want food after your time. Um, or if you travel to a new time zone, um, I recently had a very large time zone change and I uh, had like zero appetite for the first few days because it was my night. Yeah. So I didn't really want to eat like almost anything. Um, and then you adjust and you eat. but. Um, it is one of those things that your body really does get used to. Yeah. But I think pacing yourself is a great way to do it. I wonder, so as a primate, we're really, um, our young are, are um, designed for really frequent suckling. So our kind of gatherer population mm -hmm. is about every 15 minutes, night and day, in the first two years. Mm -hmm. And so that seems quite different from then, this, this later life history stage. Yeah. I know you guys haven't studied kids, but just, I wonder what you, what yeah, you no, I, I think it's really a difference in nutrient need um, and development is such a, you know, it's going to take so much energy to grow at that rate. I think your body's processing it very differently, which is why I think, you know, I wouldn't ever just be like, let's put kids on an eight hour eating interval. I don't think that's a good idea to start with, you know, like uh, maybe in specific disease cases it could, I don't know. But I do think there is a, you know, a really strong argument like what you just said for having differences in frequency and differences in duration and why you would need it at certain times. Um, you know, sleep is also much longer, which potentially is providing a natural fast. They also probably don't, you know, the amount of like gut repair that's needed at night is probably a lot less in a kid than it is in a 40 year old um, who's maybe carrying a little extra weight. So I think the, the needs for that probably do vary a lot. Um, but I think that's a great question because I don't, I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that yet. And I, I think there will be this kind of gradient of at some point you do need to kind of be more aware of it, but when you're quite young, it might not be as impactful. That being said, a big meal right before bed, I think is still gonna have a negative impact on sleep. So I think there's kind of this, these buffers around sleep that can kind of guide us a little bit. Yeah. Emily, we have a speaker here. I know his first name was Larry. I can't remember his last. Smart. But, but, but very smart, thank you very much, who's studying the microbiome. Mm -hmm. He kind of looked at it from the other side, is, is when he increased the length of time he didn't eat, yeah. it changed his microbiome, yeah. and he said he lost 10 pounds. Have, have you talked yes, to him? Yes, so about? I do know Larry. He okay. was one of our participants. He said, he, 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 yeah. oh, he said 11 to 8 was his eating. Yes, was so I've personally months. studied this man. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, we're, we're in contact with him. It, if you've heard him talk, you're probably aware he's studied himself. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Really detailed. I mean, we're working on writing a paper yeah. just on him. Okay. His data on himself is quite remarkable. You don't see that kind of detailed longitudinal data on individuals because you can't find grant funding that would, you know, and he's yeah. had the resources and he's done it. Yeah. And his son's also a scientist that I actually knew separately before I met him. And, he does all kinds of cool stuff too, so yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. Well, I can't imagine what his refrigerator looks like. You know, he, just... he has a separate one. Oh, okay. <laughs> he does have a separate one. We've talked about this because um, I was concerned. Um, but no, so yeah, so he actually cut it out. He did lose a lot of weight. This is actually on our study when he did that. Um, and we've continued following him quite detailed. He actually just came in for a checkup recently. 
Um, so yes, it's, it's a similar idea. So our lab has also looked at microbiota. We do know that the microbiota, these are single-celled organisms that also have rhythms that can be different than your kind of natural body, but when you eat can affect um, different types of bacteria. So our lab isn't doing this right now, but there are other labs that are looking at how the timing of when you eat actually will change um, the microbiome and what types of bacteria are there and which ones you're kind of supporting. Um, and a lot of my microbiome is so tricky to deal with because it's both the types of food you're giving it and now that when you're giving it. Um, um, and so it's, you know, that kind of create this whole environment in there. But that's a whole other aspect that's, that's very interesting to explore. Yeah. Um, when you do the study with the participants, is there any sort of food, you know, like don't eat above this many calories, don't eat this type of food, or Great do question. eat this type of food? Yeah, so in this pilot where it was just about 20 people, we didn't do anything. We just said, don't change anything. Do what you normally do. Um, in future studies where they're going to be much larger, like 150 people randomized control trials, um, the group that is kind of the control um, will be getting what we call just standard of care. So we have them meet with a dietitian, and we advise everyone who's going to be participating to follow a Mediterranean diet, which is kind of considered the gold standard now for most things. Um, and so we do recommend that to everyone. Now we're doing the same thing in the firefighters. So in the control group, they're still using the app and they're logging everything and they're following this kind of recommended diet. Um, but we don't enforce it, we're not providing food. Um, so it still varies a bit. It's more of a intention to treat at that point. Um, there are other labs. Um, there's this kind of pretty cool paper that came out know, last year, I guess, um, from Courtney Peterson's lab in Alabama. And they did a six hour eating interval and they provided every meal, and you had to eat the meal in the lab with the, with, the, uh, oh, yeah. with the PI, or if you weren't in lab, you had to Skype in, and you could only do that with one meal a day. This only went on for a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they saw significant changes, um, which was really exciting. And so I think we're gonna see this interesting combination of research where we take these really super controlled studies that really are not feasible to do long term, but these short term really controlled studies where you're controlling every single calorie and you're seeing them do it and you know, still some honor system at home, but still you're really seeing everything. And then combining that with some of these longitudinal studies where we're looking at three months or a year. Um, most of our studies cover about three and a half months, but like the firefighter one is a full year long study when we check in every three months. So is it like, you know, eat your three meals and a couple snacks a day, or it's just whatever? We don't control frequency. Um, okay. It's more of a, this is the types of food and this is the type of kind of nutrient breakdown that we recommend following. We do also provide a cookbook, just as kind of a, here's some ideas. <laughs> um, don't say you don't know what to make, um, that kind of thing. So we do provide some advice, but um, it's not enforced. Um, and that's somewhat on purpose. We wanted to see somewhat of a feasibility issue and what people are doing. We do still see what they ate, so we do a nutritional assessment after the fact to see if we saw any dramatic changes. Um, you will usually see your uses in alcohol because what are you having really late at night? You're having a glass of wine or, you know, probably a higher density like dessert or, you know, probably low nutrient like snack. Um, and so those things can get cut out sometimes. Um, in the most recent one, we saw that there wasn't a decrease in calories. Um, we actually had one participant who like, increased by quite a lot, um, but they didn't gain weight. Um, so that was nice, but I think it varies a bit for individuals, yeah. Yeah. One of your early slides, you noted that the SDN kind of coordinates with the other yeah. operators. question. So it's going to coordinate the timing of other clocks. It would really depend on the type of trauma. Um, and at that point, if it's if the organ is so damaged, I don't know what the rhythmicity is going to be able to function. When you, or what role it will have or the significance of the role. Um, the other thing is once you get into specific organ function, it gets really interesting because a lot of the organs will affect other organs. Um, so some of it's happening at kind of a neighbor level kind of thing going on. 
um, or changing what's going on in the blood. Um, so I don't think anyone's ever looked into that. I think the coolest SCN thing I've ever seen was in mice in 1998. They took an SCN from a young animal and put it into an old animal that no longer had notable behavioral rhythms because these rhythms kind of dampen with age. And that animal be looked like a young animal again. And their lifespan was extended to <coughs> six months, which for a rodent is quite a while. Um, and that was the more like, oh, it's a mountain of youth kind of thing. And I think to some extent, you could make an argument for that. It's coordinating a lot of systems, keeping a lot of systems functioning at a younger level. Um, but it, you know, if there's an organ that's just permanently damaged, I don't think it would be able to rescue it at that point. Yes? Let's say you're addressing a room full of high school students with questionable sleep and nutrition habits. What advice would you give them? Yeah, that's a great question. So first, before I would say you, there's a reason why you want to go to bed late and wake up late, and it's not your fault. So what we didn't talk about at all today, I should have changed this talk. Anyway, it's called chronotype, which is really your body's rhythms and how it relates to your environment. So if you've ever met what we say morning person or you know morning lark or night owl, that's relating, that is your chronotype. And that actually is, if you took the actual exact period length of your internal rhythms, if it's a little less than 24 hours, you're gonna be a morning person. And you're actually shifting back a little bit each day, but you wake up earlier than your kind of set point. And if you're a night person, like a lot of us are, you're, you're gonna wake up a little later and you have to force yourself to wake up earlier every day. Now to make this extra complicated, your chronotype changes throughout your lifespan. So when you're very young, you have an earlier chronotype, and it starts to get a little later and later and later, and right around high school age, you're at your latest chronotype, where your body wants to go to bed later, and it wants to wake up later, and we have these early start times for school that says, it doesn't matter, you get to wake up early, and you have to do this, and you better go to bed early, even though your body doesn't want to, and then everyone thinks you're lazy, and that's really probably not true. That being said, they still have to get up at that time. So I would say it's not your fault, but you've got to learn how to adapt. So there's some tricks you can do. So decreasing light at night is a really big one. Um, blue light especially, which is extremely common on any screen, um, is going to directly suppress melatonin. All light suppresses melatonin, but blue is by far the most potent, and it's by far what we're looking at the most at late at night. Um, and so that's going to make it harder to fall asleep. It's going to tell the SCN directly that it's not night. So decreasing light at night is key. If you are going to be looking at a screen, um, there are blue light filters that come on now, which is why your screen might look orange at night. Um, that's actually quite helpful. Um, and if you're watching, if they don't have that option, you can get like these um, orange glasses that block blue light. That can actually also quite be helpful. Interestingly, that also helps people with migraines, similar system. So I would say decrease lights at night. I would say give it yourself a decent buffer on eating before you go to bed. So give yourself that like three hour buffer and don't be like super active. Don't get in any big fights or, you know, emotional <laughs> kind of trauma. <laughs> don't watch anything that's going to raise your heart. I mean, teach your body that it's, we're slowing down, right? Dim lights, don't eat, relax, that kind of thing. Um, that can help you fall asleep when you're supposed to fall asleep. Get into bed, turn the lights off, close your eyes and just try to force yourself to some extent. Then the opposite of that is tell your body it's time to wake up when you do wake up. So get a lot of really bright sunlight within the first 30 minutes of when you wake up. So sun actual light if possible. If not, turn on every light you can because we're actually the most sensitive to light at night when we shouldn't have it and we're the least sensitive in the morning when we expect it to be there. So turn on those bright lights to reinforce this is when I wake up now and then keep you know, your brightest light and your highest calorie foods and all your most intensive activity to like the first half-ish of your day and then kind of pace down from there. Um, and so that's really what you can do to kind of tell your body it's time to wake up um, and teach it the best you can to get to that system. It's still gonna be harder. It probably won't feel right. Um, the interesting thing comes on weekends. I, I recommend letting them have recovery sleep so you should still try to go to bed at that same time, just don't force yourself to wake up. And if you're entrained and you're actually on your schedule and your body, you know, everything's going the way it should be, you'll wake up at the same time anyway. Likely high school kids 
don't get enough sleep during the week, so they're gonna need more sleep and they should be allowed that rebound sleep. Your body can actually recover a fair amount with a couple nights of extra sleep. That doesn't mean they should stay up as late as they want, because <laughs> that'll kind of defeat the purpose. It's what we call social jet lag. It's like you're bouncing back and forth between the east and west coast pretty much. Um, so I would say it doesn't mean you get to stay up forever, but it means you should be able to sleep in as much as you can to try to catch up. So it's a little tricky. It's not great, but they do have kind of the short end of the stick. So trying to work with the model is, is good. We're also dealing with the fact that we have athletes who are doing major activity late in the afternoon, <laughs> yes. going home starving. Yep. And Probably binge eating a bit. Well, and there's a little different. They have this huge calorie need to refurbish things and um, you know, it's, it's just as bad as if they, had, you know, if they had to wake up really early in the morning and work out, I feel almost worse for that because they're probably getting even less sleep and they already have an early start. I think late afternoon is kind of your borderline. I mean, especially for working adults, you see a lot of people, it's like, oh, I get home and I, I, I go on my like, you know, really intensive bike thing at like 10 p.m. and then I try to go to bed at 11.30 and I was like, well, that's probably not the best, it's like, well, I'm starving after. And it's like, okay, <laughs> well, if you did that, you know, that's gonna be tricky. Um, so late afternoon is not the worst, you know, at least you get a you know, good dinner and then just try to stop yeah. eating after dinner. Um, but that's a legitimate challenge. Um, and this is, I don't know, what, what's your guys' school start time? Eight, eight. eight o'clock. Oh, that's a lot more reasonable than a lot of others. Like a lot of other schools are like 7.15. It's like, that's really early. Like. I don't know how people, I don't get to work. <laughs> yeah. Should schools be better equipped with lights? I mean, should we have light, uh, natural light instead of just these? Kind yeah, of so light? natural light is probably one of the bigger things that we don't get enough of. I think this is very common for adults in general and offices. It's, it's really common where you're not getting as many windows. At least classrooms usually have windows um, that kids are somewhat near. But natural light is a great know champion even if it's a cloudy day you're still getting a lot of really bright light so the difference between um, indoor light say we didn't have windows here and having it kind of bright this might be like 500 lux of light if you're going outside we're probably like somewhere between five to ten thousand lux of light um, so most indoor lighting is not going to give you the same type of intensity as a sunlight would get and that's what you really need in those early morning hours when it gets later in the night unfortunately we become more sensitive so those same lights are getting a conflicting hue to say it's still time to be awake. Um, so there are actually specialized lights. Um, I forget what they're called. It's like these sun lights. Yeah. Yes, and actually MIT gives them out to students now to help with seasonal depression. Um, so this is, I, I know some shift workers that use these and swear by them. Um, it really depends on the individual, but using that as a way to kind of reinforce that it's morning, especially if it's dark when you wake up or if you're in certain shifts or whatever it may be, those can actually be quite helpful for people. Yeah, so it's a good point. But natural light is usually the best. Yeah. I missed the first few slides, but there was a lot of focus on when to eat, but I didn't see a lot of focus on when people actually went to bed and woke up. Yeah, that's a great question. Didn't really talk about that. That's, that's a good point. So um, it, it, I wouldn't say that there's any one right time to go to sleep or wake up. A lot of that's gonna depend on your own system and how you relate to the environment. And unfortunately for our society, when you have to go to work or whatever other responsibility you may have or taking care of someone or whatever that is. Um, so depending on what your requirements are, then for an individual, you can kind of figure out what it should be. Um, if you don't have, theoretically, if you have no requirements and you can do whatever you want, um, and this was actually kind of done in a study. So there was a group from Colorado that showed the best way to figure out what your natural circadian rhythms are and what they should be and kind of resynchronize everything is to go camping. No artificial light after dark, only fire. And people sleep longer and you see they usually wake up earlier actually because they go to sleep earlier because a lot of times we're actually staying up as late as we are because we have so much false stimulus, right? We have TVs and computers, and even though the sun went down, we're staying entertained and we're keeping ourselves awake. Um, and I don't know if you've ever had the experience of having a week-long power outage. I personally have, because I lived in Massachusetts for five years. Um, we had a snowstorm in October, but we had no power for like a week. You go to bed much earlier when it gets dark, at like 6.30 and you're freezing and you have nothing to do, you know? and it's. But before 6.30 might have been hard, 
Um, but your sleep patterns change. So I would actually say go camping to figure out when it should be. Um, if you find out you're a super morning person, great. You probably know you've been keeping yourself up unnecessarily with extra stimulus. Um, and if you aren't and you are a later person, then you gotta do these things, like we said, for high school kids, where you've gotta figure out how to trick your body kind of in a certain way. And there's only so far you can push it. Um, there are studies where people try to like get you to fit to a 28 hour day or a 20 hour day. Your body can't do it. At some point, it'll just ignore all the cues and say, I can't fit to that. It's called a range of entrainment. You just physically can't do it. Um, but you can push it a little bit one way or the other. So it really kind of depends on your specific schedule. I think I meant more, that was good, but <laughs> it's not what time you go to bed, but it should be the same time every time. Ah, good like, point. Yeah, said, so overall, should, yeah. If I, wait, if I sleep in one morning or my mm -hmm. son sleeps in one morning, can we shift our whole time-restricted feeding? That's a good question. Days? Okay, so as far as your eating window, I say it's the same time every day, regardless of when you went to bed. Um, unless you know you're going to go to bed really early, I would try to stop eating earlier just for that little buffer so you're not disrupting sleep. Um, but otherwise, the circadian system is an anticipatory system, so I want to let it plan for what's going to happen. Um, and I think that's one of the main differences between a lot of these intermittent fasting kind of things where it's like you can move it around as long as you get X amount of fast, it doesn't matter when. I, don't, I think there's this added circadian benefit that those completely ignore. Um, and so I would say it is, it is the same time. As far as bedtimes, I do recommend the bedtime to be about the same. Um, and then wake time, really, we should be waking up when we're done sleeping, right? <laughs> so without an alarm clock, theoretically, you, you just wake up. Um, we don't usually have that luxury, but on days you would have that luxury. I would just say don't set an alarm and, and wake up when you wake up. Because if you go to bed around the same time and you sleep in, it's because you needed it. Like your body's not going to stay asleep for fun, like for no reason. And usually if you're on a pretty regular schedule and your body's actually in training, you will wake up at the same time. You might kind of wake up and go, oh, I'm so tired, I'm going to sleep another hour, but you probably will wake up at least for a minute um, and kind of note the time and be like, oh, okay. Um, so I would say, yeah, sleep onset is, should be, you know, kind of set in stone to some extent. It's a little wake up, you know, kind of depends on what you need. Do you have an access code for the app? So to get the access code, you have to go to the website, which is mycircadianclock.org, and you sign the informed consent, and then you'll be emailed an access code. Emily, you know, Salk Institute is just three and a half miles away. Yeah. And then we have a learning community here of 1,200 people. Um, when you need people, can you put us on a list? We could say no, but uh, we want to be yeah, part of sure. things you do. Is, is it possible? I know you're working with La Jolla High School. I'm kind of curious are. how they were selected or, or determined because... A donor of, uh, that had a family member that went there wanted to increase their science program. Okay, all right. And funded us to do a project okay. with them. Yeah, those donors, they come in here. Yeah, handy, money, money makes the world go around. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's how that happened. We have thought about extending to other schools as well, so that's definitely something to okay. contact you about. Um, but yeah, great. Yeah, so, so All right, absolutely, stay in touch. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I'm sure there's going to be I'm sure there'll be some people that want to ask you questions yeah, directly. Of as a small token of our appreciation, oh. a book called Leading with Dignity. Oh, thank you. I think you're already there, <laughs> uh, but we appreciate this, and thank I hope so you're not much. a stranger. If yeah, at any so. time you think of something that would be important for a K through 12 community or educators, know just yeah. you, you've got my email. Email me. We'll get it out. Well, if you ever um, want us to talk to students, we can. Get something more there. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we won't. I'd be happy to. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very, very much. All right, enjoy. Thank you very much.